Aloha, people, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. It's my, geez, about 40th show, 40th show on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm really excited about having a, a good friend who's been a friend for 29 years, which makes both of us old. Uh, I first met him, I'll tell you that story now before I bring him on the screen and he can repeat it. I first met him when he was an assignments officer for new colonels. And he told me uh, when in uh, Air War College, he said, Big, you're going to go be the ops group commander at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. And I said something that starts with a B, all right, because I thought it was baloney. I wasn't a, you know, one of those kind of guys who's going to get a great job like that. But he was right. I did. Uh, he was one of those guys, really a, a shining star of our Air Force, a great friend for those 29 years. So... We'll get, to, we'll get to Jeff in a minute, and we'll get to doing 710 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, but I have to start with my opening rants, you know, a little bit of a carryover from figments on reality. Okay, guess what, people? The mask mandate ends Friday, Saturday, sometime, whenever people really start taking off their COVID masks, and I look forward to it, not because it was a bad idea necessarily. We didn't know much about COVID-19, um, but because it'll feel good and it will stop some of the insanity. Let me give you the latest case of insanity I witnessed when Alejandro and I were on our way to Costco on Sunday. Okay, that's insanity in its own right, going to Costco on Sunday, but we're driving along and both me and my guest are avid motorcycle riders. Uh, but there was a motorcyclist next to us on a sport bike, and he obviously had a self-image that he was a badass, all black, kind of tough looking in terms of dress and demeanor. And he had a COVID mask, a black COVID mask on his face and no helmet and no helmet. So the virus wasn't getting him, but the pavement might have. So I look forward to the that being over and not having to look at some of the ludicrous approach to virus avoidance, the approaches to virus avoidance that we've seen. So that's rant number one. Rant number two um, is the government settlement. I've finally gotten my social security payments, all of them, as far as I can tell. Thank you, government, for giving me back what I gave you. And then finally, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about China's strange place, because I feel like China is in a very strange place right now. Uh, first condolences to the really tragic aircraft accident that happened there, an airliner in southern China. Uh, there's some video out there, really a, a horrible situation. We'll see what the investigation shows. But my, my condolences there. The strange place is China is now, thanks to President Xi Jinping, aligned with Putin. That's not too surprising, except that Vladimir Putin has become a pariah in the world community. And that's a strange loyalty to hang tightly to. And it seems that they are. Maybe that'll change. Um, secondly, is the COVID pandemic in China, where I think they're first in, last out. They were the first, of course, to experience the disease, whatever circumstances it might have been under. Um, but because they had a zero case policy tightly restricting everything, now it seems like they're going to be the last out and they're having some significant outbreaks as other countries are on the wane and losing their mask mandates and everything else. So very interesting. I wonder what it means for Taiwan's ambitions, the economic pressure that they'll feel, the lessons learned or not learned from Russia and the Ukraine, who knows? So. Those are my rants for today. Let me welcome Lieutenant General Retired Jeff Remington, longtime friend, golfing buddy, great golfer, better than me, by the way. Hey, Jeff, aloha. Aloha, Peg. Nice to be here. Hey, it was great to see you back in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago and play some golf. Um, always, always a good time. Uh, today, I want to talk uh, from the outset about your matriculation. I think that's a word to becoming an Air Force uh, Thunderbird, the Thunderbirds, smoke on ready now. But it starts with kind of a story that seems likely, but as we discussed it, was kind of unlikely. So um, you were 
<laughs> everything I wasn't. You were the class president. You were the captain of the baseball team, right? Have I got that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there you are, both as a baseball player and a, a cadet. I was uh, voted most likely to do hard time in my high school class, so we, we weren't alike. Uh, you, and uh, so it would seem like you were a shoe in to get into the Air Force Academy and Zoom, if you will, not referring to this system we're on right now, Zoom to the top of the Air Force, but it didn't happen that way. No. Tell, no, tell I, 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 go ahead. No, tell me about it. You're the I, guest. I, was, uh, I grew up in California. I played a lot of baseball in California. I, um, about halfway through my sophomore year, I moved to Oregon on the coast where it rains constantly and uh, was hoping that we could play baseball there and I could somehow get somebody to pay for my college education by mm -hmm. playing baseball. Well, I'd only play 12 games a year because the rest of them get rained out and you're in a little teeny league, you don't get noticed and um, no scholarships were gonna happen. And uh, like I said, I was just looking for somebody to pay for my college education, period. My dad and you found, you found that. In, I, I did, I did. My, my dad came home and said, hey, uh, you ever heard of the Air Force Academy? And I said, no, sir. I said, I've heard of West Point. Perhaps I'd heard of Annapolis. No internet, so you know, who knows? Uh, but I definitely never heard of the Air Force Academy. And um, he said, well, you know, you gotta give it a shot. I'm talking to this guy and, you know, at work and he knows that, yeah, you're the student body president the capital of the football team and all that stuff. And uh, maybe you can get in. I said, sure, let's give it a shot. So, and I did. So you got in and the rest is history. No, oh. didn't, didn't work that way. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I didn't get in. I mean, I got nominated the first year, but because my uh, SAT scores were not high enough, mm. I didn't get in. And the uh, Senator freshman from Oregon by the name of Packwood um, was the guy that nominated me. So his guy, his chief of staff, whatever, called my dad after I didn't get accepted the first time and said, hey, there's this opportunity to go to this place called Millard Prep School, which they has 72 students. 72 students are on either a Skelly Foundation or Falcon Foundation scholarship. Your son would be student number 73, <laughs> and uh, he will be on the Remington scholarship. <laughs> and my dad said, okay. Uh, didn't now, ask wait, me. Now, but wait a minute, Jeff, I got to ask you, because I, I do know this. Your dad was a B-29 pilot, right? In World War yeah, II. Yeah, B-29 pilot in World War II. And, and he had an airplane, Piper Cub, I think you said. He did, Piper Cub. So why wasn't, why wasn't he steering you, and why weren't you naturally inclined to pursue I, this Air Force thing anyway? That's I, kind of strange. I, that, that's a great question. Uh, it really is a good question that I don't really know the answer to. Because like I told you, I went to, I finally got into the academy the next right. year and had my first jet aircraft ride, which was in a T-33. Now you really know how old we are. No, but uh, me too, as we And uh, a T-33 ride, and I must admit, I was airsick. I thought, mm -hmm. oh my God, this is awful. And uh really didn't have much a desire to go fly airplanes after that. But between my freshman and sophomore year, that summer, I went to Operation 3rd Lieutenant. And uh, where the flew. Air Force Academy cadets go out into the field to right. bases around the world, really, and uh, experience what it's what it's like, what jobs right. they might do. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I went to Luke. And I had four rides in the back seat of an F-4 and five rides in the back seat of an F-5 with the aggressors. And when I left there after three weeks, I said, I will be a fighter pilot. I had more fun than man should be allowed to have. And uh, that really got the bug going in me. 
And of course, graduated with the pilot training at Williams Air Force Base. Probably the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. The pilot training, why? Because I, I remember pilot training for me as a great experience, but not the most fun. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it's because I was learning something new. Yeah. And I, it was, wasn't easy. It was a lot of hard work, but it was coming to me. And, uh, you know, Friday night at the bar, how can you not have fun as a second lieutenant with no money? And right. uh, hey, it Jeff, really I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you right there to say to folks who imagine young pilots at the bar Friday night as some kind of scandalous watch this on the news later. It really wasn't. It was no. just fun. And just, so I, I'm kind of getting back to your right pilot train. It's joie de vivre like you can't describe. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, Sorry to interrupt, but it brought back yeah. memories. Well, that's that's the rest. That's how I got into, into flying airplanes. And, uh, you know. But you, you didn't go right to fighters, which is interesting. And um, mm -hmm. when I look at your career, uh, you, you were a, an ATC Air Training Command T-38 instructor, the fast jet, sexy fast jet, uh, for a few years and then got into fighters. But I've known you for years, and this will be my, what would fig do at the end of it. I've known you for years, and I learned something about, new about you every time we talk. You did really well as a pilot, but you also got drawn into staff jobs, working in headquarters, and they weren't they weren't just somebody needs to fill the bill. They were, I know they were the kind of jobs I would not have been asked to do. Um, so that it's in, it's just interesting to me that you went back and forth successfully. You got into the F-16 and you were, uh, you were a pretty darn good F-16 pilot or they wouldn't have made you the demo pilot, right? Yeah, I was uh, at Tarho in Spain and, mm -hmm. uh, as a captain now, because I became mm -hmm. a captain when I was flying T-38s. So a, a little more senior to the other guys. Uh, I had a whole lot more hours than the other guys did because I had 1,200 hours in the T-38. Wow. And uh, by the time, by the time you know, in three years at Torrejon, Spain, I got 1,000 F-16 hours. So I would say I probably had... 500 hours of F-16 time when they asked me to be a demo pilot. And, and the uh, demo pilot puts on a single ship air show basically for folks. Uh, and if you've never seen one, go see one. The F-16 is a fantastic airplane. And, um, but it's a, it's a very demanding profile and only the very best uh, get to do it. I know as an F-16 wing commander, when I chose my demo pilot, that it was going to be the best possible person to do that. So now you're in sort of the hot pilot mode. Great. But then you're shipped off to the staff to be a staff officer in Germany. Right. Which is, you know, to me, it's again, this kind of dichotomy. Hot stick, too good to leave in the cockpit in some ways. And I'm not sucking up to you because you know I would never do that. Um, but uh, but it's interesting, and that's how you wound up on the Thunderbird. So it's this ping pong back and forth. Tell me a bit about your applying to the Thunderbirds and getting selected for the team. I, I really, uh, what I was contemplating was trying out for weapon school, but I had mm -hmm. left the cockpit and I was sitting on the staff at, in the U.S. Air Forces Europe as a personnel person working rated officer assignments. And I ran into a good friend of ours, Dana Atkins, out in the parking lot. Uh, Another Dana, golfing buddy. Dana was working for the instructor, uh, the IG, uh, as a you know inspection guy. And um, Dana had applied for the Thunderbirds the year prior, and he was reapplying his second year. And uh, he was still flying the A10. I was not in a flying billet. Uh -huh. And he said, "Hey." Throw your hat in the ring and be a Thunderbird. And I said, eh, you know, okay, I'll give it a try. And lo and behold, the two of us were selected to go to the team at the same time. 
And uh, I remember the uh, USAP commander was shocked. Why is this captain in personnel going to fly a Thunderbird? <laughs> he was more surprised than anybody. Who was the commander? Oh, I think it was General Russ. I Maybe? No, I don't think German. Anyway, we'll look that up later because it's interesting to us, but I can imagine. So uh, to me, you're still, you're still in my mind, the captain of the football team, class president, academy graduate. I was none of those. You've been the demo pilot. Um, you're doing really well, but when you found out you'd been selected for the Thunderbirds, was that a moment? It was quite a surprise. Yeah, it was. It how was, did you feel? Tell the audience how you felt. Surprised. One, I didn't think I'd get selected because I, I you know, there were a whole bunch of guys there that I knew that were, I thought, more qualified than me. Yeah. But we can get into that later um, yeah. because it's not necessarily how well you fly an airplane. That's important. But that's not your primary responsibility. You actually are a walking, talking recruiting poster for right. the United States military. And, and I, Jeff, I'm going to interrupt you to say if, if Eric could bring back the picture I had up there. All of us have that image on the left of on the ladder of a T-38 Falcon. Oh. <laughs> Very few of us have that image on the right with our Thunderbird jet. But you're, you're an ambassador. You're a, a recruiting tool, so to speak, um, and, and it's a big responsibility, not just to not screw up in the air, but it's a big responsibility to represent the Air Force well. So it was a lot of fun. I can tell you that it was much more challenging than I expected it to be. The flying or the other part? The flying. Really? And, and, and I will tell you that there were times that you got put in the hot seat, not, not intentionally, but some you'd have to answer some question that some event that had just happened in the news that you might not even know anything about because we didn't have phones back then. Right, and, thank uh, God. You, know, you might land and all of a sudden some reporters is in your face and you're trying to talk about the air show and they're asking you a question about what just happened in Russia or China or North Korea. And, oh, interesting. Uh, man. Hmm, I would not have expected that. Sometimes you got put on the spot by law enforcement, and I do want to talk about that next because one of my favorite parts of, of your Thunderbird experience <laughs> is this speeding ticket right here. <laughs> and uh, if you can see that, folks, it says 710 miles an hour in a 55 zone. And even my Mustang won't go that fast. Jeff's Corvette won't go that fast. This is a great story about the camaraderie of the team, you, your crew chief, and your local host. So Share that, if you will, and then we'll take a quick break. We were doing an air show in uh, Southern California, and uh, the California Highway Patrol on their motorcycles <laughs> had to escort us from the uh, hotel to the air show because of traffic. Mm -hmm. So we got to the air show and, you know, doing all the standard air show stuff, and the my crew chief, had actually talked to the California Highway Patrolmen that were there, and they brought them out to the, to the, uh, what we call the, where, well, they where they record the air show, they record everything on film, they play the music, yeah. and all that stuff. So they brought them out to the trailer, and they're talking, and my crew chief turned around to the California Highway Patrolman and said, "Hey, he's going to do the sneak pass, and he does the sneak pass. He's going to come from left to right, from behind the crowd." And so, and it'd be going pretty fast. And the guy says, great, I've got a radar detector here. Well, let's see how fast <laughs> he's going. Now, I was going 0.94 Mach, which That's is fast. called, yeah. It's critical Mach on the airplane. Parts of the airplane are, are supersonic, but the whole airplane is not. So you don't break windows and that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, but I was going 0.94 when I went by him and after we with the speed brakes up because we're at sea level. Nice. Yeah. And um, 
I didn't know anything about it. The guy puts the radar on me, takes it. Nothing said. I land, the air show's over, we go sign autographs, and now we're going to go back to the hotel, and we have a public relations event at the hotel after we get there. Any of that community leaders and other interest folks come and this That's is right. that these are the kind of things where you're really the ambassador. You put right. on a great show and exactly. now you're being Thunderbird lead solo, Jeff Remington. <laughs> so we got there and and uh, I don't know, we're 15 minutes into it, you know, and all the introductions. Have did you have a beer in your hand? Did you I did have a beer in my hand? And uh, all of a sudden, here comes this uh, California Highway Patrol on his Harley running with the siren and the lights going into the ballroom and he gets on his microphone, you know, his bullhorn and he says, uh, I need to see Jeff Remington. Oh my God. And of course the crowd's laughing and clapping and everything. And sure enough, he has a ticket for me and he got me doing 710 miles an hour with his radar gun as I did the sneak pass. And I thought, no, nobody else has a ticket for doing 710 miles I'm hour. in awe. Not, I'm uh, keeping that. I but, might have some tickets, but none for 710 and the 55. I wonder what the scale of fines would have been. Hey, Jeff, that, a, a great story. Um, let me take a very quick break, folks, if I can, to talk about my next show and tell you What's going to be on my next show uh, two weeks from today on April 4th? I have no idea because the world is just crazy. It is absolutely crazy. So something will come up and we'll talk about it with ideally with a friend of mine, somebody I know or find who can illuminate it. Um, 710 miles an hour. That's, that's awesome. That's might be a record. So Jeff, you and I, we took different paths, but we we're basically fighter pilots to like flying jets and and just kept trying to plug along. And I think people might think it might find this to be self-deprecating, but neither of us, I don't think, really expected to be three-star generals in the Air Force, and yet we were. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? Look at us. I look taller than you, and you know that I'm not. <laughs> But, but so since we were both blessed with the opportunity to lead our uh, Air Force and, and our military in some pretty challenging jobs, your last job was as the commander of 7th Air Force in Korea and the deputy commander of U.S. Forces Korea. My last job was as a deputy of PACOM. We should know things, right? You think. We should know things. So let's talk about a couple of the areas we should know things about very quickly. We've got a few minutes left. One obviously uh, is North Korea. And while everything else has been swirling, Russia, Ukraine, the pandemic, the environment, the, the economy, the North Koreans have embarked on a, a bunch of missile tests. And I showed this slide last week, but I created this slide, therefore I like it. It's something I put together back as the um, summits between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump were approaching that shows the progression of text, tests up to 2019. And I was convinced that North Korea was specifically seeking military capability, that it wasn't a provocation, tit for tat, whatever sort of a thing. Uh, now they've got a new, very aggressive test program that included one failure recently what do you think about what North Korea is doing? Are, are you concerned? Is it just more of the same? Uh, yeah, I'm concerned. Uh, it is more of the same, in my opinion. Uh, and we've had these philosophical discussions over more than we have one, one beverage. And I, I, I just, I don't think that any administration from 1992 forward has gotten it right. Um, he still has his nukes. So I maintain that there is a way to 
monitor closely the fissile material that he has and monitor closely the nuke weapons that he has. Uh, and you do that with two basic assumptions that are going to be counterintuitive to, or uh, counterintuitive is probably not the right word, but any administration won't agree. One, nobody dies. That's that's right. That's the number one assumption. Nobody dies on either side. On either side. Okay. Because that. we don't need loss of life. Right. Number two, he will never, ever give up his nuclear weapons. And you think that's they spent, fine? They spent too much national treasure. There's internally he's he spent too much all his you know his, his grandfather his father him the whole kim dynasty has put too much emphasis mm -hmm. on it. they're never going to get rid of them so what can do we do? accept that and and say it's fine that you have nukes or do we have to um maintain a facade that nu that we still want you to denuclearize but in our hearts we know you won't well then let's say it out loud because I think it's more important that we have IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency mm -hmm. Inspectors, right. which is a world organization. It's not just US. Mm -hmm. It's an international organization, it has US people on it, that are in North Korea that can inspect, have full access. They have to give us full access. The quid pro quo is you're going to keep your nukes. But we have to have full access and we have to see fissile material and inventory nuclear weapons. Because so, they, go ahead. Why, why, my, no, don't go ahead. Let me go ahead. <laughs> to what end? So if we're letting them have nukes, but we're monitoring the daylights out of them having nukes, what have we accomplished? We won't risk fissile material in the hands of terrorist organizations or nuclear weapons in the hands of terrorist organizations okay, we will so know it's a North Korea counter, counter proliferation issue and then i'm going to add to that because we're running out of time that will um, also ensure in the event of significant change in the north korean government we'll have some accountability because i know one of the things that you and I both worry about our loose nukes, nukes in the hands of a non-governmental organization. And, and uh, if a regime collapses or there's a, a big right. upheaval in North Korea, we don't want that to go crazy. Okay, we've got about 30 seconds for you to solve the Ukraine problem. Do it, you're on. Boy. Now let me, let me give you a break and say, what worries you about Russia, Ukraine? Anything? Uh, escalation escalation beyond Ukraine into NATO countries, which then draws us in. And, and yes, we could face World War III. Uh, we could face nuclear World War III. We could. That's very, very possible. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned about what Putin may do if and when he is backed into a corner. Would it be chemical, biological, nuclear? Yeah, who knows? So how do you, and the question to myself is how do you avoid it? appeasement and escalation simultaneously and i don't have an answer to that maybe that'll be another show jeff i wish we had more time that's the goal of my shows is to get to the end and go damn it i wish we had more time um and i really appreciate you being on uh, we'll see you and michelle sometime soon i hope i'm going to ask you first do you have a figment now do you have a dream a goal something you haven't done yet in your life that you'd really like to do or are you good? I'm good. You know, if I've had a, I've had a, I've had a great life. I've had great friends. I've been all over the world, and uh, I just wish I could, you know, break par. <laughs> <laughs> if I break par on one hole, I'm happy. So, yeah, um, shot. I played pretty well Saturday. You would have been shocked. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for thanks for joining me. It's always a pleasure. I'll close with what would Fig do? Because that's uh, something Fingers Goldfein asked me to do. Uh, what would Fig do? So every time I talk to Jeff Remington, uh, I learn something more about him. So we all have great friends. 
uh, who make our life better, but we only know a bit about them. And so my what would FIG do is I'll continue trying to learn more about my friends and appreciate their lives better. Uh, the other thing I do is donate to Spirit of America. I mentioned that last week and or two weeks ago in talking about their work in UK Ukraine and elsewhere around the world. So take a look at them, Google it. I'd like to say thanks to ThinkTech, but before I do, I got to show you my QR code here. So take a happy snap of that and look at the playlist for Figments, the Power of Imagination, or Figments on Reality, both of which are brought to you by ThinkTech Hawaii, a wonderful nonprofit corporation, and they deserve your support as well. So mahalo for joining me. Thank you. That's what that means. I will see you in two weeks on April 4th. Aloha.